I wanted to stand out and build a global career. So I chose to earn a future focus. Hello everyone, good afternoon, and welcome to Cloud School's free class titled A Beginner's Journey into IoT and Prototyping, examining the ESP32 development board. Right? So today we are going to be taking a look at the ESP32 development board and uh, some of the use cases uh as well as what it is even right but i'm not an expert uh our expert will get to that in a bit but before he comes uh i would just like to briefly introduce cloud school so we are an edtech company that provides training in the area of cloud technology right and i know that is a, a broad umbrella it encompasses cloud computing, IoT, big data, and analytics, uh, as well as ML and AI, right? So we provide training in these key areas, okay? And so today's webinar is going to be delivered by one of our course developers and tutors, who is actually responsible for our IoT course, implementing an IoT solution, it is available on our website, so you can enroll now. We have opened up uh, for enrollment for the next cohort, which starts in January, right? So you can uh, sign up for that. Today, we'll give you a glimpse of what you'll be signing up for if you register for that particular course, right? But it is a very tiny fraction of what the course entails. Okay, so without much further ado i will hand over to our instructor for today samuel mason oh and by the way i am hartwell i am billy Cole. 
uh, and um, co-founder and CEO of Cloud School and one of the instructors, all right? And before I hand over, I would just like to uh, credit Vem Systemi for the IoT intro video we saw. They, they have a video series called IoT Stories and they have some very interesting animations on the use cases of IoT and uh, some of the projects, right? Some of the IoT projects are available, right? So shout outs to them uh, for that very cool video. All right, then I won't waste any more of your time. I'll hand over to Samuel because I know he has a lot to go through today. So Samuel, please take it away. Hello, everyone. As Hartwell rightfully said, I'm Samuel, Samuel Mason, and I'm the, I'm going to be the facilitator for this webinar. So this is just a heads up. Unfortunately, today I'm not feeling too well, and I'm sure probably you guys can hear from my voice. So in case anyone does not hear me clearly, you can just put raise your hand and hat or let me and I'll just go over what I said. And in the course of the webinar, if you have any questions, you can also raise your hand and hat or would alert me and I would address your issue. Okay. So we are going to have a look at the ESP32 board. And the title for this webinar is A Beginner's Journey into IoT and Prototype. And we are going to examine the ESP32 development board, right? I'm guessing most of you are very new to IoT. So I'm going to try my best to explain everything from the beginner's level, right? If something is too complex, I might probably skip over it and with time, I mean, you will get to understand. And as Hattel said, this is just a free course. So we are just showing you glimpses of what, what is going to be in the actual course. So it's not everything we are going to show you. So for the objectives for this webinar, right, we are going to first begin with an introduction to the ESP32. Then we would look at the specification and features of the ESP32 board, some of the applications of the ESP32 board, then the pinout. So we will go through what each pin does for the ESP32. Then we will have a demo session where we will set up the ESP32 on the Arduino ID software. Then we will go through the ESP32 Bluetooth feature and the Wi-Fi feature. So just to begin, like I promised, I, I was, I'm going to give you a brief overview of IoT, right? So IoT simply stands for Internet of Things, right? And basically, is the, in layman's term, is the interconnection of devices coming together to perform a specific task, right? And in the world of IoT, we've realized that one key component is having the network or communication device, right? And in this case, that's the role that ESP32 is going to play. So mostly if you have a project, mostly you have sensors, or actuators, which would be, I mean, on the ground, interacting with the environment, right? Then you would have an MCU or a microcontroller, right? Which is going to be the brain of the project. And that MCU is going to tell the sensors or actuators what to do, right? Then you have another component where you transfer the data. So probably you are going to use either a Bluetooth device, a GSM device that can help you send data through the SMS. You can also have a device that can connect to the Wi-Fi 
or devices that send device uh, data through radio frequency, right? But in our case, what the ESP32 does is that is a microcontroller board, right? And the very picture we are seeing here in our screen is the ESP8266. This is one of the very first ESP models that we have. And for this, for this model, when it came, it's a combination of, like I said, the MCU, right? So the controlling process of the of the whole project, and at the same time, it can connect, it has Wi-Fi features, so it can connect to the internet. So it became very handy at the time it came out, which is 2014, because you could just use this board to give instructions to sensors and actuators and at the same time transmit data over the wi-fi right however as time went on this board became a little bit outdated right it became a little bit limited and these are some of the reasons why we needed to upgrade the board so first of all it was using just a single core mcu right and it has a 20 megahertz channel bandwidth of transferring data which means it wasn't able to transfer a lot of data at the same time and also this board it, it uses just two gpio pins so later in the webinar i would take you through what gpio pins are but generally they are general purpose input and output pins so these boards have just two so it means that it can either connect to just two sensors, connect to just one sensor and an actuator, or connect to just two actuators. And if you are very unfortunate and you are using a sensor that engages all the two GPIO pins, then it means you can just use one sensor, right? And most IoT projects, sometimes you would, or most times you would need a lot of pins where you can interact with a lot of devices right and also for this particular board there was no bluetooth feature so because of that we needed to have another board where we could i mean we had to advance to kind of like follow the technology trend so this is the esp32 board right and due to the limitations of the esp8266 the ESP32 board was introduced. With the ESP32 board, these are the specifications. So it has an output power and an input power of 3.3 and 5 volts, respectively. And this makes it very ideal for IoT projects since already most sensors and actuators operate on these voltage levels. It also has a built in flash of 32 megabits. It has an onboard PCB antenna and it supports these peripheral interfaces. That's the UART communication, the I2C, and the I2S. And these are just communication protocols that allow the ESP32S transmit data over different communication protocols, right? It has more GPIO pins, it has about 32 GPIO pins and which is far more than the two that was that was previously used in the ESB8266. It has an analog to digital converter, a digital to analog converter, and most of its pins are embedded with a pulse width modulation. So as time goes on, I will explain all these, what all these means, right? It also follows the Wi-Fi protocol, the IEE802.11, b slash g slash n wi-fi protocol and it uses bluetooth 4.2 which has a frequency range of 2.4 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz because of the features and specifications of the esp32 it's very ideal to use the esp32 for projects in home automations industrial automation, smart agricultural systems, health systems, and vehicle trackers. So these are the pins 
for the ESP32, right? There are, I, I forgot to mention, there are a lot of ESP32 bots, right? Def we have different companies producing different bots, right? But for the purpose of this webinar, this is the Node MCU ESP32S, right? So this board has 38 pins. So if you count everything, it's 38. And out of that 38, we have 32 being GPIO. We have we have specific pins which are suitable for whatever you want to do, right? And I will take you through that. So per the image we have here, you realize that some pins are just input only. And those ones are the ones with the orange circle around that pin. We have some pins that are both input and output and these are the gpio pins right then we have we have some pins that have pulse width modulation in other words you can regulate the voltage and trend those pins right so the gpio pins the gpio pins are like i said general purpose input and output pins so these are the pins that you connect your sensors and your actuators to right out of the 38 pins in the esp32 32 of them are gpio pins and out of that 32 we have 10 being capacitive sensor gpio pins we have two which are i2s interfaces we have 18 which are adc channels 12 bits adc channels we have two which are 8 bits dac channels and we have 16 of those being pulsed with modulation output channels so let me go ahead and just explain the i2c so the i2c is a communication protocol that makes it that makes the esp32 capable of transmitting audio sounds so it means if you use the esp32 you can send audios to another ESP32 or to another person, right? Because of the I2S, I2S feature that it has. Most development boards do not have this. So it's a huge plus for the ESP32. For the 10 that are capacitive touch pins, they, these pins generally sense variation in anything that holds an electric charge so a basic example is the human pin the human skin right so anytime the human skin touches any of these pins you would just realize that it begins to give certain variations or certain readings in the esp32 so the capacitive touch pins are the ones labeled pink right so i don't know if you can see my screen but if you can see my screen, you realize that we have touch underscore nine, touch underscore eight, the ones labeled pink. These are the capacitive touch pins. So anytime you want to work on projects where probably you would want to use a person's touch to trigger something, it is very advisable or suitable that you use the capacitive touch pins. There's also the analog to digital converter, right? And I did mention that they are 12 bits channels, right? So it means that because they are 12 bits channels, it's two raised to the power 12, and that is 4096, right? But actually, the numbering starts from zero. So we have zero to 4095, right? And th these pins are very similar to the analog pins of the Arduino just that in the analog pins of the Arduino, they go from 0 to 1023 because they are 10 bits channels, right? So basically, using the ADC pins from the ESP32 gives more accurate analog readings. And you realize that when we are working on projects with these pins, they kind of like, there are some sensors that give analog readings right so it's very advisable you use these analog to digital converters when you are using those sensors so sensors like the soil moisture sensor sensors like the joystick model variable resistor 
and I actually have a variable resistor here. So when we are demoing, I would probably show you what I mean, and the ADC would make more sense to you. Just as we have the analog to digital converter, we also have the digital to analog converter. And basically what this does is that they convert digital signals into analog signals, right? Let me go ahead and just talk about the PWN, right? So the pulse width modulation, what the pulse width modulation does is that all the pins that have the pulse width modulation output, right? What they do is that you can actually regulate the amount of voltage going to that pin. So I just want you to think about how fans work in your house, right? So you see how you can regulate the speed of the fan. So when you put it on zero, the fan is off. When you put it on one, it comes on. When you put it on two, it's faster than one then three is faster than two and so on. That's how the pulse width modulation also works. But this time, everything is coded or programmed into the ESP32, right? So you write the code that, okay, maybe on GPIO32, which has the pulse width modulation output. I don't know if you can see my screen. The GPIO32, it has a Kelly line which means it has a PWM output, right? It means anything connected to the PWM output, uh, GPIO32, I can use it to control, I can write a line of code that can control the amount of voltage that will go into that, right? So basically the ESP32 produces three volts, right? 3.3 volts. So if, within the GPI open, I can let it maybe give two volts or three volts or 2.5 volts to that specific pin based on the line of code that I'll write. And based on the voltage that you give those specific pins, it regulates the speed, just like the fans that we have in our homes, right? So if, let's say, you, you have a motor connected to GPI 32, and you regulate the speed, you regulate the, I mean, you write a line of code to give it maybe two volts to GPIO 32. When you come back and you change the line of code and you say you want to give it 2.5 this time, you realize that it will go faster because you've increased the voltage, right? And voltage is directly proportional to the speed of the motor. Okay, so that's how the pulse width modulation work. And that is all for, I mean, the PPC presentation. I'm now going to take you guys to how to download and install, then set up the ESP32. So because you are all beginners, well, I'm sure there are some experts here, but we promise you we are going to treat this for beginners, right? So I'm assuming probably most of us here don't have our Arduino ID installed. So all you have to do is just type Arduino ID, right? Then you come to the Arduino web page, the Arduino website, right? So when you are here, you would, it takes you to the software tab already, right? And when you come to the software tab, you can download your Arduino ID. Your Arduino ID is basically the software where you write all your lines of code and upload it to your bots, right? And it's mostly for the Arduino development bots, right? So the Arduino Uno, Arduino Nano, Arduino Pro Mini and so on. Right, but the ESP32 is can be compatible to the Arduino ID, right? Which makes the ESP32, I mean, it gives it a plus because a lot of people are conversant with the Arduino ID. So this is Arduino ID 2.2.1, right? And when you come here over to the green section, you can download which one agrees with your operating system. So if you have a Windows 10, you can go for the Windows download. If you have a Linux or a Mac OS, you can also download which one 
is suitable for your operating system, right? But this is the Arduino IDE 2.2.1. This is one of the new Arduino IDEs that came out. And not a lot of people are conversant with this yet. So sometimes, mostly people download the Arduino 1.8.19, right? So we have also the download option for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS here. So you can download any one you like, right? We have the Arduino 1.8. And we have the Arduino 2.2, right? Basically, the Arduino 2.2 has been come, it's made everything easy, right? Also, on your ESP32, there's one more thing that you would have to install. So if you look at your ESP32, right? I don't know if I should go back to the slide. Yeah, let me go back when the picture was big. Yeah. So you realize that even this is animated, right? But we, ha we have the chips here on it, right? But the chip wasn't labeled, right? So mostly the chip that it uses, if you look on it very well, if you have a rectangular, a rectangular chip, right? What we have here is, is the square one, right? But there's one which is a square and that's, if you look on it, you would see CHP210X, right? It means you need those drivers too. And those drivers help you to upload the code from your Arduino ID to your ESP32. But if you check and you have a rectangular chip, right? Then it means you need the CH314, right? Drivers, right? So based on what I have here at home, which is the node MCU ESP32S. What I need is the CHP210X, right? So you just come over here and you download the, the driver, right? So you just click here, then you download the, the driver. Then once you download it, you install it. I already have it, so I'm just not going to continue. That's okay. So now we've gone through downloading the Arduino ID. We've gone through downloading the drivers. The next thing we have to do is setting up the ESP32, right? And for the ESP32, the first thing you have to do, give me some time to connect my board to my laptop, right? In setting up the ESP32, once you download the Arduino ID, you now have to come and install the ESP32 board on the Arduino ID. Like I said, the Arduino ID was made for the Arduino development boards, right? That's the Nano and the Uno and the Pro means, right? So even though the ESP is compatible with the Arduino ID, you still have to come to the board manager to install the ESP32 libraries, right? And to do that, you just have to come to tools, then board, right? So you realize that we have Arduino AVR boards here and we have ESP32. Ideally, when you install the Arduino ID for the first time, you shouldn't have the ESP32, right? But I have already installed my package. That's why I have ESP32 showing here. So when you come to boards, you have to come to board manager or you can simply press control shift B, right? So when you come to your board manager, this appears and you just have to type ESP32. And we are going to download the package, which is by the ex expressive system because they made the boat, right? So we have ESP32 by expressive systems here, right? So I've already downloaded mine. So I'm not going to remove it. Right. I've already installed mine. So if I hadn't installed mine, I would have had install here, just like we can see over here. So if you have install, you can just click on yours. And you would wait a while for the board to install. Right. Once you have your boards installed, you now come to file, right? And you go to preference. So the ESP32 board has 
um, an additional board manager URL, right? It's, it contains resources and packages from the ESP32, right? So you have to have the link or the URL of that. And I already have mine, which is here. If you check online, you can get it when you simply type the ESP32 resource package, right? But it's here. This is mine. So you just copy it when you get it online and you come and put the URL here. This is to enable you get ESP32 resource packages on the Arduino ID. Just in case maybe you are already on the intermediate level in the in embedded systems and you've already added another board URL here. All you have to do is just come to the end, press a comma, then paste the link of the ESP32 so that it can add both board, uh, additional board URL, right? So that you have the packages for both ports, right? But I have just the ESP32 being an additional board. Then you click on OK, right? So once you do that, you are done setting up your ESP32, right? So the next thing on the agenda is to test your ESP32. And to test your ESP32, what we do is that we go to, we normally test it with the blank code. The ESP32 is embedded with a built-in LED, right? So what we are going to do is that we are going to use the blank code to test to see if the ESP32 is working, right? So you go to files, go to examples, then basics. There's already the blank code there. Okay. So let me maximize the blank code. It has already been written here. I mean, Arduino, the Arduino ID, they already assume if you are going to install this, yeah, we are beginners, so they, they have some sketches already there. When I say sketch, I mean codes, right? That's how we say code in Arduino. <laughs> so we have some sketch there that we perform specific tasks, right? So in the sketch, they have commented certain things. So when you read, you just get to understand what the thing is supposed to do, right? So we have the blank code here, right? And I forgot to mention, when you open your Arduino ID, you realize that there are two places. We have the void setup and we have the void loop. Basically, everything that goes into the void setup runs only once. But anything that goes into the void loops, it runs it runs in a for loop. So it runs and goes, then comes back and it will keep on running until there's no more power powering the ESP32 board. So once I upload this code, you would realize that the board would, the built-in LED on the board will keep blinking until I remove power from the ESP32 or until I come and upload a different code. Right. So anytime you are working on a project and you want to run something in a loop over and over and over again, you put it in a void loop. Right. Mostly, if you want certain things to run at your discretion, that's when we normally put in switches or push buttons and those things to kind of like trigger them or close the circuit for it to run over and over again, right? But let me not get ahead of myself and confuse you guys. So yeah, this is the blank code and we are going to demonstrate the blank code, right? I have my ESP32 board already connected here. So it will be blinking from my side, but you guys won't be able to see. So what I'm going to do is that I, I have a video, right? I made a video and I'm going to play for you to see how it works, right? But let me go through the code with you. So in the void setup, the first thing we have to do, right, is to make the ESP32 aware of the pins that we are using, right? So in our case, we are using the LED built-in. The LED built-in 
pin, right? Uses the same pin as the GPIO2, right? So you can either write LED built in here, just like that, or write two here. It's going to work the same way, right? So you initialize it by telling the ESP32 that you've connected a certain output to the LED building, mm -hmm. right? And you have to, doing that, you have to write the pin mode. So the pin mode is the function that does that. It takes two inputs, the first being the pin that you are engaging, and the second being the well, uh, telling the ESP32 whether it's an input or an output. So basically, inputs are sensors, things that are going to give data to the ESP32, and outputs are things that the board is going to, I mean, output from it, right? So then we come to the void loop, and we want to, uh, we want the the ESP32 to to um, let the built-in LED come on for a second, then go off for a second, then come on for a second, right? So to do that, we have to digital write LED built-in high. So basically, when I power my ESP32, all the pins are, have already been put to low by default, right? So I have to digital write it to come on, right? And to do that, we have to say, okay, this pin, power should be given to this pin. That's basically what you are doing by saying digital writes LED built in high, right? So high is just given its power. Then we have the delay function. And what the delay function does is that you are delaying the whole line of code for 1,000 microseconds, right? Which is one second, right? Then the digital writes LED built in low. So just as how you give it power, after one second, you want to take the power from it so that the LED will not come on, right? So we do that and we delay for 1,000 microseconds, which is a second, right? So basically, that's, that's all the blink code does, right? And in the Arduino ID, we have buttons here on top. We have the verify button. If you want to verify the line of code you wrote to see if everything is correct, once you press the button, it's going to verify, right? And if there's an error on a specific line, they will let you know that there's an error, right? But if it verifies and everything is fine, that's good. It tells you it's done verifying, right? There's this button that uploads. So once I click on this, it would upload the code onto the ESP32 board, right? So I've already connected it to the ESP32 board. So once I hit upload, it's going to straightly upload the code onto the ESP32 board. But then again, if there's an error, it's not going to work. They, they are just going to tell me that there was an error in uploading. An error occurred when it was uploaded. Right. So you would have to rectify that error before you come back and you upload. So because of this purpose, a lot of people don't verify, right? They just upload. I mean, the uploading has verification inside already, right? But also to set up the board, I forgot to mention, to set up the board completely, right? I already have my node MCU 32S connected, right? But if you've not connected your ESP32 to the Arduino IDE before, what you have to do is that you come to tubes, right? We've already installed the board manager, the ESP32 board manager, right? So once you install the board manager, you remember I told you that for the ESP32, we have different companies producing a lot of boards, right? So these are all the ESP32 boards that we have in this world. <laughs> Yeah, there are lots, there are lots, right? So now you have to look on the device that you have. When you turn the device, you realize that they've, they've written the name of the specific type of board that you have. And mine is the Node MCU ESP32S, right? So you have to go through everything and pick that exact board. 
So this is my node MCU 32S, right? When you do that, after you also come to your ports, right? When you come to your ports, you realize that these are your USB ports, right? I have something connected to pin nine, something connected to pin 10, right? But I don't know what's connect, which one my USB board is connected to, right? My, I mean, my ESP32 development board is connected to, right? So for me to know, Sometimes the only way to know is just to remove your ESP32 from your laptop, right? Once you remove it from your laptop, that's the USB connection. You come and you realize that it's the pen tender left, right? So then you put it back in and this time you connect it to the pen 10, right? But because I installed the Arduino IDE 2.2.1, right it has this feature where you don't even have to go to tools to select the board then the the ports right for those ones as soon as you press here you would see the uh, ports and which ones are connected to it but i've already connected the node mcu to content right the that's you the usb port so because when I connected this board to it and I specifically chose the Node MCU 32S board, once I put it in again, it, it knows the board, it recognizes the board that I've used this board before and this is the Node MCU board I used, right? So once I put it in, it automatically connects, right? So you can just select it here and everything is fine. So once you select it and there's something connected to it. You realize that it boldens, right? It becomes clear. So now I upload the code. On the ESP32 development board, you will realize that there are two pins. There are, there's the EN or the reset pin, and there's the boot pin. Once you're uploading a code, you have to press on the boot pin. You have to press and hold on the boot pin for it to finish uploading. So once it's done uploading, once it's done uploading, you can leave the boot pin, right? And now you have to press on the reset pin for the code you just uploaded to start working. So once you press on the EN, you realize that I have my board here with me and it's blinking, right? So it's blinking for one second, goes off for one second. But I said I was going to demonstrate it, so um going to play a video that does that. So this is a video to demonstrate how the blink code works on the ESP32. And again, we are using the node MCU 32S ESP32, right? So this is the blink code. And I've already gone through the blink code. So the first thing you do is to upload the code. Then when you're uploading the code, you make sure you're pressing on the boot button, which is on your on your left. Right. So you press and hold it until. So the reset button is the button on the right. You press on it and the blink code starts working, right? So it goes on for one second, goes off for one second. And because the cycle is in the void loop, it keeps on repeating. Okay, so that's, that's the blink code, but I'm going to play one more time for those of you who didn't get it right. So this is a video to demonstrate how the blink code works on the ESP32. And again, we are using the node MCU 32S ESP32, right? So this is a blink code. And I've already gone through the blink code. So the first thing you do is to upload the code. 
then when you're uploading the code, you make sure you're pressing on the boot button, which is on your on your left. Right. So you press and hold it until the code is done uploading. It's has started uploading. Can you promise that you leave it? And it says press the reset button. So the reset button is the button on the right. You press on it and the blink code starts working. Right. So it goes um, for one second, goes off for one second. And because the cycle is in the void loop, it keeps on repeating. Okay. Okay, so that is the blank code, right? I promised you guys when I was explaining the ADC that I was going to demonstrate how the ADC work. I, I nearly forgot. So let me let me run through it very quickly, right? So I'm using a variable resistor this time. And the variable resistor is connected to GPI, GPIO pin 32 which is an ADC pin, right? That's an analog to digital converter pin, right? And the variable resistor gives analog readings, right? So readings from 0 to 4095, uh, right? That's 4095, right? So I'm just going to upload this code and I'll demonstrate it using my serial monitor. But let me explain the serial monitor to you guys right so on the arduino id we have a built-in monitor which we call a serial monitor right so once you are upload your code you just press on this button which is the serial monitor on the top right when you click on it the serial monitor would appear and what the serial monitor does is that it displays certain information that you the designer when i say designer i mean the programmer right would see what you want to, I mean, what you are looking for, the values you want, right? So we are using the variable resistor and the variable resistor, because we are using it on the ADC pin, is, is going to give us readings from zero to 4095, right? But if I was using the same variable resistor for an Arduino Uno, it's also going to give me readings from zero to 1023. Right, so this is has more. This has a wider range, so making it more accurate, right? And the viable is this: I've connected it to three point three, the three point three of the Arduino about the ESP thirty two dev board. I've connected it to ground, and I've connected the data pin to GPIO pin thirty two, right? So what we are doing here is before the void setup. I mean, we've assigned a variable which is analog pin and we have given it a pin of 32 right we've given it a value of 32 right the reason why we did this is so that we wouldn't come and write i mean because we've we've assigned it to a variable you just have to call the variable anytime you want to call the pin right so normally we do this because if you assign it to a variable from the beginning and let's say you have i mean if you have a long line of code where you have analog pin instead of you writing analog pin you wrote 32 32 32 and you repeat so many times in your code right in case you want to change the pin from 32 to let's say 33 you would have to come and change it in the lines of code the numerous amount of times you wrote it you have to change it else it's going to there's going to be an error in your code so mostly most programmers just like um assigning it to a variable here so that the variable will just be called and it would be given the 32 value right so in case let's say this time you change it to 33 all you have to do is just come and change it over here once and for all and anytime you reference the analog analog pin is going to give you the value of 33 right so that's just by the way so the const int we see 
before the analog pin is just a data type right so we've given it and uh, we've given that variable a data type and we are saying we want a constant integer right so once we assign it to 32 here it's going to be constant and it's going to be 32 it's going to remain 32 because if you connect it to that pin it's going to be 32 once we upload the code so if i change it to 33 and i upload the code again it's going to be 33 right then we create another variable and this time this variable sensor value is going to have the value of the variable resistor so the variable resistor is a resistor is a resistor that can be tuned right so once you tune it you'll be getting the values right and the values will be stored in this variable right so these are the two variables that we have variable for storing the data value of the variable resistor then we have a variable for storing the pin of the variable rate variable resistor so now you come to the voice setup and the voice setup the first thing we do is to initialize the serial monitor because you are going to use the serial monitor right and by initializing the serial monitor anytime you want to reference the serial monitor you have to start with serial right so because we are serial with a capital s right because we are initializing it to start the function for that is begin. So serial.begin. But once you use serial.begin, you have to select the baud rate of the serial monitor, right? And the default baud rate normally for the ESP32 is 115200, right? That's the default baud rate of the ESP32. Normally, if you are using an Arduino Uno, right, or a Nano, you realize that the default baud rate is 9600 right so you will type 9600 and the reason why this is important is just bear in mind that the the value you are writing here the board rates that you are writing here once you open the serial monitor you have to also select the same board rate for data to be transferred successfully if you choose a board rate here which does not match with the board rate of the serial monitor you are going to have an error or you are, you are going to have gibberish right it's, it wouldn't be able to process the data that is reading right because it's communicating at different speeds right so in the line of code we used the serial dot begin one one five two hundred so bear that in mind so in the void loop the first thing we do is that now we want to read the value of the analog pin right and the function to write that is analog read right i already made mention that the adc pin are mostly used for devices that have analog readings right so you realize that when you were using the blink code we had digital writes right because those ones have digital inputs but this has an analog reading right or an analog input or outputs right so they give analog readings right so we are using the analog read function to read the value of pin 32 right and this is analog pin the value we wrote right so we are reading basically reading from 32 and the value that we have it should be stored to sensor value so sensor value is going to be assigned to the current readings that we are receiving right from the pin 32 then after the serial dot print so i made mention that anytime you want to reference the serial monitor you type serial dot right then the function so serial dot print basically is going to print a, a, a value for us right but we want it to be arranged nicely it shouldn't just print the value right so we have serial dot print then in strings right analog value anytime you have serial dot print the bracket has to come and when the bracket comes anything you have in strings is going to print that sorry it's going to print that exactly right so it's going to print that exactly then we have serial dot print line so we have ln included and what the print line function does is that normally when we are done when we are done printing you would realize that the cursor will still be on the same line but when you use this print line function it goes on to the next line in the serial monitor right so serial dot print
serial dot print in strings analog value so we are going to see that exact thing then we have serial dot print line sensor value so it's just going to call out this variable that we have sensor value which has stored the which has stored the uh, the readings from the analog pin right then we are going to delay for one second then when we delay for one second the whole loop runs again right so i'm going to upload this code i already have my variable resistor here connected to my esp32 i'm going to upload this code then i'll open the serial monitor and demonstrate everything that i've said so far to you guys so i'm uploading the code i have to hit i have to press and hold on the boot button okay so it's done uploading let me open my serial monitor this is my serial monitor and this is where you select the board rates right so i'm going to press the reset pin for everything to begin right so you see now it's giving me an analog value of zero but once i tune my variable resistor you realize that the value start changing and it's going to come up until i'm still tuning to my left so i'm tuning it goes and the maximum value you can give me is 4095 because it's using the ADC pin, right? I'm going to tune it back to zero. And it's going down. If I leave it halfway, the number remains around that range, right? So it's around the 1638. But I'm going to continue tuning it down for it to give me zero. Right. And it's giving me zero right so that's how the serial monitor displays data right so in case you are prototyping and you are testing to see you want to see what value your sensors are giving you you can use a serial monitor for that and just like i was saying let's see in our line of code the code that was uploaded we already wrote a a board rate of 115200 so i'm just going to demonstrate what if i use a board rate which is not equal to it right so you see i start receiving gibberish start receiving question marks and weird characters but once i change it back to the same board rate, everything comes and you realize that it gives me the values on a different line because I included a serial dot print line over here, right? So once it gives you the value, the next time it's coming to write something, it's already gone to the next line. Okay. So yes, this is just me demonstrating the ADC pin, right? Using a variable resistor. The next thing on the agenda is showing you how to come use the Bluetooth feature for the ESP32. And for that, we would also be watching a video. But before that, I want to show you the code that does that. So these are the ESP32 Bluetooth serial, right? And serial to serial BT, right? Let me go ahead and clear my output. Okay, so this is the serial to serial BT, right? And this is this code has already been given to us as an example code for the ESP32, right? And it includes a library over here. So when you go through the line of code, you realize that there are there are some more advanced functions that they are using right and it's as a result of the library that they have already installed right so basically i'm just going to tell you what this code does right so this code allows us to connect to the bluetooth of the esp32 right so basically on line 12 right what you are doing is you can give the bluetooth a name the esp bluetooth a name over here right so the default name here is ESP32 BT Slave. And that's the name I'm going to stick with. But let's say if you want to 
change your name to something you can put it here maybe you can type cloud school and anytime you run this code you realize that you have cloud school showing right then when you come to the void setup we are initializing the serial monitor right so the the esp32 the serial monitor will just act as a screen right so that anything you communicate to the esp32 via bluetooth right would be displayed on the serial monitor right and to do this you also need an android application right that is the serial bluetooth terminal and when you have that when you have that app right it's on play store so you can download it from there when you have that app you can communicate to your esp32 using your phone right and i mean if you have the scale you can connect probably sensors to the esp32 and let them transfer the data onto your phone via bluetooth right or better still you can use your phone to control the actuators connected to your esp32 right maybe if you want a, an led light to come on once you send a certain message from your phone to your esp32 the light should come on you can do that using the bluetooth terminal app and this line of code this sketch right so in the voice setup you initialize the the serial monitor and the serial monitor is going to print the device name of the esp32 right so that you know the name the when it might, someone looks on the serial monitor he can know the name you gave to your 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 esp32 bluetooth right then in the void loop what's what it does is that it will just keep checking to see if it has received any data from any device right and whatever it receives it should it should just write it on the serial monitor right so it should just display it on the serial monitor that's the only line of code in the void loop right so all these things all the print print functions you see before the void loop they are just they are just going to run once right on the serial monitor then now it will just be looking for information right for the device which has been connected to it right unless maybe i hit on my reset button and when i hit on the reset button everything will reset so the void setup will come in i mean will run again so you might see that function again being printed right so enough with the talk let me just demonstrate what i'm saying so let me go ahead and just play the video So in this video, I'm going to take you guys through how to communicate with the ESP32 using the Bluetooth terminal app, right? So I've already uploaded the code and after uploading the code to your ESP32, what you have to do next is to open your serial monitor. And when you open your serial monitor, make sure it's the board rate is aligned with what you wrote on the code and for this example the board rates i'm going to use is 115200 board rates right so when you open your serial monitor i'm going to go ahead and reset my esp32 by pressing the reset pin and i have the information that we see the device with name ESP32 DTC has started meaning the 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 Bluetooth device for the ESP32 has been is, is now visible so I can connect to it on my phone. Right. So let me enlarge in the serial monitor so we can see more from it. So now to connect to the Bluetooth of the or to pair to the Bluetooth of the ESP32, I have to to my bluetooth on my phone because i've not paid to it mm. i have to come to the available devices and i see that in esp32 bt slave hit on it then pair with it okay okay so once i pair with it i can now come to 
my serial Bluetooth terminal app. This is how the serial Bluetooth terminal app looks like. Let me go ahead and delete the previous checks. So when you open it and now you come to devices, then ESP32 BT slave. Because that's the name of the device, so I'm just connecting to it. Right. Now they said I'm connected. Right. So now that I'm connected to my ESP32 via the app, any message I'm going to send on this app is going to display on my serial monitor. And anything that I'm going to send from the serial monitor is also going to be displayed on the phone, right? So let me go ahead and demonstrate. I'm going to type from my serial monitor to the Bluetooth terminal app first. I'm going to type hello. So you realize that the hello comes on my phone. How are you? I am Samuel. Or oh, let me probably say I am ESP32. Right. And that we can display on my phone. Right. Now I'm going to send a message from the phone to the serial monitor. And I'm going to say hello. I am fine. And you? Let me go ahead and clean the head. Once you send a message using the Bluetooth terminal app, the message doesn't leave. Right? So for you to send another message, you have to clean the first message. Okay, so um, I am fine and you is no full stop. Um, I am Bluetooth terminal app. And everything is going to display on the serial monitor because I didn't clean the I am fine and you before typing I am Bluetooth terminal up. It combined the two. Let me clean it and resend it. Okay. I am Bluetooth terminal up. To send the next message, you have to clean everything. Please. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Anyways, yeah, this is how to communicate to the serial monitor or the ESP32 using the Bluetooth terminal app, right? And also, when you look here, I've, I've already edited, right? But then we have on of M3, M4, M5, and M6, right? But previously, we had M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6, right? And you can hit on any button, right? So let me long press on the on, and you can give it another name. So I want to stick with the on, right? And give it any value. I want to give it one. Then you can give this name to or can change the name to off. Give it a value. You can do same for the MC give it a value of three right and another name another name for it probably let me write tv okay so now what this does is that because i've assigned a value to all of them once i press on that button it's going to send the value to the serial monitor. So when I hit on on, you would see one being displayed on the serial monitor. When I hit on off, you see two being displayed on the serial monitor. When I hit on TV, you see three being displayed, right? So one, two, three, right? But when I hit M4, M5, nothing, nothing is displayed. Right? So there's no value. Use long click to edit, right? So now based on this, we can use this in our IoT devices where we can see, okay, when the ESP32 receives a one value, maybe something should happen. An LED should come on or it should do something. When we press on off 
a value of two is being sent to the serial monitor. So we can say, okay, when it receives a value of two, maybe the LED should go off. When it receives a value of three, right? Meaning we are hitting the TV button, right? Probably a TV should come on or something like that, right? So that's one way we can use the Bluetooth terminal app inside our projects. Thank you. Hello. Okay, so I don't know if you really got what I was saying towards the end, right? So based on the Bluetooth terminal app, right, you can actually use the ESP32 for a lot of home automation projects, right? So you labeling the, the I mean, the buttons, right? M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, and M6 too actual gadgets that you have if those gadgets are also connected to the esp32 you would actually realize that you can actually use it to control a lot of devices at home right for instance if you have a plug which is connected to the esp32 and you press on the button and you are like okay if you want if it receives a value of one maybe it should come on if it receives a value of two maybe it should go off you would be able to control every gadget from your home through your phone, right? And it's it's a very cool application for the ESP32. Yeah, so this closes it for the Bluetooth feature, right? This is why a lot of people like the ESP32, right? But we are going on to talk about the Wi-Fi feature. And for the Wi-Fi feature, the ESP32 has there are two ways you can use it right either as an access point or as a station point right so you using the esp32 as an access point is basically you using it like a router right or as a router right so you would basically you would basically create a local address where other devices can be connected to right and if you do that you can use the those devices connected to that local address of the esp32 to control something which is connected to the esp32 right so we are going that's that's the next thing we are going to demonstrate right using the esp32 as an access point right so fortunately for us there's also this line of code that has that already right i mean there's this sketch the sketch is already uploaded on the Arduino IDE as part of the things that we installed, the ESP32 packages. So you just have to come here, examples, and look for Wi-Fi. Yeah, Wi-Fi, right? So we have, what I was talking about is the Wi-Fi access points. Using it as a station point, we have the simple Wi-Fi server right and i even forgot to mention you can also use it to scan the number of devices right or the number of networks right close to the esp32 so if you want to scan to see oh, which internet can you connect to you can also use this line of code which is the wi-fi scan i think we should demonstrate that first before we go to the access points right so this is that line of code for that right yeah so basically in the code what is asking it to do in the void setup is basically print out the networks which are available right prints the wi-fi ssid that's the name of the internet prints the rssi the wi-fi channel and the wi-fi encryption type so whether it's we P, WPA, WPA2, right? It's going to tell us all that, right? So let me just upload this code. There's nothing I have to change here.
Okay, so it's done uploading. So I open my serial monitor and I press on the reset button. So it's going to let me enlarge my serial monitor. So it has started the scan. Currently, they said I have just one network here. So I'm going to go ahead and put the hotspots on my phone on. And let it scan one more time. Let's see if you find it. It has the name of Cloud School. Okay, so that's it, Cloud School here. Yeah. And you also have the Huawei network, right? Okay, so yeah, this is the Wi Fi scan. Put in my hotspot off now. Okay, so now let's go back to the main thing we were discussing, which is Wi Fi access points. Come to Wi Fi, then Wi Fi access points. Okay, so this is a Wi-Fi access point, right? Basically, the code has been written for us already and is using, what we are going to do in this sketch is that we want to control the built-in LED of the ESP32, right? From either our phones or our laptops, right? So what we have to do is that we are creating, remember I said in access point mode, you are making your ESP32 like a router, right? So you are, you have to you have to put in the ssid that you want your esp32 to be called so the default is your ap right and the password is your password right you put it in the line of code here but if you want to change you can change it here but i'm going to i'm going to use the same thing right so your ap and your password so you realize that once I upload this code and I check from my machine, the networks available, I would see, I would see this. Sorry. Okay, so the code is done uploading, right? I can open my serial monitor. So when I press reset, oh, when I press reset, it gives me all the information I need, which is the AP IP address, right? So I have to come over here, then I have your AP here, right? But I'm not, I'm not going to connect to it because if I connect to it, the call is going to go off. I'm going to drop off the call, right? So yeah, this is it, right? So once you connect to this, you just have to copy this IP address, then paste it on your web browser. And from there, you can, you can control the built-in led so if you come to the void loop you realize that they've created buttons right if you go to the local address they've created buttons and if you click on those buttons it would either trigger the led to come on or to go off so the next demo video i'm going to play is going to demonstrate that exactly right hello so this is just to demonstrate we using the ESP32 as a Wi-Fi access point. So copy the IP address, then you paste it on your web browser. Once you do that, you receive this, right? And you click here to put it on. As you can see, my LED has come on and it's very instant. Press it goes off. Very instant. Um, off. 
Okay, let me play it one more time. Hello. It'll be very short. So, let's adjust to the on streets. We use an, the ESP32 as a Wi Fi access point. So, copy the IP address, then you paste it on your web browser. Once you do that, you receive right and you click here to put it on as you can see my LED has come on and it's very instant you press it and goes off very instant on off thank you okay so don't forget that even though I use my laptop for the demonstration you can also use your phone right you just have to connect to the the device the the network right that's the your ap network your esp32 ip address when you have it you paste it on your web browser then you would have access to either turning on the led on or off right so this is using the esp32 as an access point as a router this time you want to use the esp32 in station mode right so for that we have to come and go to examples and upload the simple wi-fi server which has already been given to us but in the simple wi-fi server there are there are some lines of code that you have to change because you have to connect to the internet that you have okay so this is the ssid right so what you have to write here is the ssid of the internet you have at home then your password you have to write the password that you have at home the password of that internet that you have right so when i was demonstrating this i used the hotspot for my phone right and the ssid is cloud school the password is cloud school so when i'm showing the demo you would see it over there right so what this does is that apart from this it's actually the same as the access points lines of code right you the only difference is that for the access points you generate the password and the ssid you want right and it will generate the ip address for you the esp will generate the ip address for you but this one you connect to the internet so you write the network you want to connect to and its password right then also you would realize that this line of code assumes is using an led on pen 5 right but from the beginning i told you the built-in LED is on pin two. So you either have to come to pin mode and change this five to two so that you can use it to control your built-in LED or have an LED and connect it to pin five, right? But right now I don't have an LED here to connect it to pin five and at the time i was doing the demo two i preferred changing this to two so i changed this to two i mean you can type two or led built in any of them works they are the same things they are the same pins right but in the void loop two you have to change it at two different places right so that 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 is at this side you change it to two and at this side you change it to two right and you are good to go also when you open your ip address you realize that because the line of code was written for pin 5 it has pin 5 here so you can also decide to change this to i mean um, led on you can change all this line and write built-in led right and you can do the same for this so that's exactly what i did for the demo yeah then you upload the code right 
once you upload the code, you realize that they will let you know whether it's successfully connected to the internet or not, right? So I'm going to go ahead and play the video for you to see the demo. Hello. So this is just a simple demo video demonstrating how to control the built-in LED of the ESP32. So what we are going to do is come over here and there are two buttons. One says click here to turn the built-in LED on and the other says click here to turn the built-in LED on the ESP32 off. So you realize that as soon as you press here, the light comes on. When you press here, it goes off. On, off. On. What happens when it's on and you still click on the on button? It still remains on. And when you click here, it goes back off. When you hit on the off button whilst it's still off, it still remains off. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, that is you using the LED, you using the ESP32 as a station point to control the built-in LED, right? So you realize that the ESP32 comes in very, very handy in the sense that you can use it to control a lot of device or a lot of gadgets remotely, right? But because this is a be beginner course, I'm just using it to, with respect to the built-in LED. Right. I, I don't want to overwhelm you guys with controlling other other things. Right. So this brings us to the end of our webinar, right? But then again, I'm going to show you one cool project that I saw online and I feel it will motivate you guys a lot in your IoT journey, right? So I have here with me the DHT11, right? And for the DHT11, we've already covered this in the implementing an IoT solution course, right? So once you join the course, you will know how to configure the DHT11 and how to connect it to either the ESP32 or the Arduino Uno, how to write lines of code to receive accurate temperature and humidity readings, right? But for this webinar, I'm going to show you how to connect it to the ESP32 and how to display information coming from this sensor, right? So I'm briefly going to show you that. So give me some time to connect, right? So the DHT11 has three pins. The ground goes to the ground of the ESP32. The, the plus goes to 3.3. Then the, the data pin goes to, per my line of code, I choose GPIO 26, so pin 26, right? So I have it connected here. Let me make sure my and i'm going to just open that line of code my board is no longer connected so. okay my board is connected now and we see if everything works okay okay Okay. Okay. So let me open my serial monitor and it's going to tell me whether it's connected. 
yeah so it's connected to the huawei 2.4 g so i i wrote the ssid and the password here it's connected so now you can tell me it's because it's connected it has generated an ip address for me and i just have to take that ip address like i demonstrated copy it then come over to my web browser put it there and you can see oh I don't think it's connected. Oh, I swapped the. Yeah, I swapped the values. Sorry about that. I swapped the pins. Sorry. I'm doing the connection again. Okay. Okay, so now it's coming. Let me make be sure everything is right. I think I've damaged my board when I swapped it. But yeah, I'm still going to get the values coming from the serial monitor displaying the right. So you have temperature to be 59 and humidity to be 25. Right, but it's not working correctly because I swapped the ground and the VCC pin, so my board is acting up. I mean, my my temperature sensor, right? So on the IP, you see the same values being displayed. Yeah, you see the same values being displayed here. Right. So any change that happens on the serial monitor, you see it happening over here. Right. And per the line of code, it changes every second. Is it every second? Yeah. So yes, this brings us to the end of this webinar. And I'm going to leave room for any questions. So if you have any questions, please let me know. You can simply raise your hand and Hatol will alert me. In the absence of no questions, then we can call it a day. Okay, so we have uh, Bainin, AJ. Uh, you can go ahead and ask your question, Bainin. Yeah, so um, the first question, you did mention of a course, I think when you are about ending showing this um, DHT11 sample project, then you made mention of a course that you can take. I just want to know how you can get access to it. Okay. How to would you want to take that? Yes. Uh fortunately I can take this one. <laughs> All right. So yes, 
uh, as I said, Cloud School provides training. Um, and one of the forms of training we do is for professionals and individuals like our participants on the call today, right? So currently we have three courses that are up and running. Uh, oh, and we develop the courses ourselves from scratch. So we have currently three that are developed and ready to go. Uh, one of those courses is an IoT course, and the name of the course is Implementing an IoT Solution, right? So as the name implies, it takes you through the, the basics of IoT. Uh, it takes you through embedded systems. So you learn the basics of electronics, and uh, development boards, motor sensors, right? Just like you're doing right now. And there's a course on IoT, right? Which deals with the interconnectivity of all those sensors and devices after you've built a solution. So the entire program is meant to take you from a novice, probably someone who has only heard about IoT to someone who can actually complete an IoT project, right? Uh, it's in two parts actually but for now uh you can sign up and get access to all of it to the complete package and we'll take you from beginner to uh an intermediate at least who can develop a prototype right in iot so to access it just go to our website uh, cloudschool.africa and uh, you see the list of courses on there and then you can enroll for the IoT course, right? And for those on the call today, we are giving an extra uh, discount package to you guys. So at checkout, just enter ESP32 to get 30% off of the current price, right? So access it on our website. Can you come again with the name of the website? Cloud School North Africa. Is that right? Yes, Cloud School North Africa. I'm leaving it in the chat so you can access it from there also. But yes, Cloud School North Africa. The school is SCH. So Cloud SCH dot Africa. Okay. Okay, and then you said the promo code is ESP32. Yes, ESP32. Okay. Um, to my second question, I mean, this one actually goes for someone. I mean, it could also go for you. At all. No, it goes for someone. Yeah, it definitely goes to someone. So, um, now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not new to IoT per se, but then, um, I don't know, I'm just looking for an opportunity for mentorship. So, I don't know if I know someone. I don't really know for hard work. But I mean, since you guys are in charge of the program, definitely I'm sure you can also be an MP. So I don't know if you guys are available to mentor someone if they are up for the challenge. Okay, so I, I I think this actually does go for me. All right, so at Cloud School, uh, we offer a variety of uh, services and products in the form of courses. And we are relatively young, uh, new. So, and as I mentioned, we develop all of our content and our material ourselves, right? So we are working on such a path and uh, such a package but not necessarily live yet. All the same, you can reach out to me and then we will see how best it fits into uh, our scheme of activities currently, right? So just send me an email at hatwell at cloudschool.africa. Leave that in the chat as well. And let's continue because yours is uh, sort of a unique situation, right? We can guide you on what the next steps can be for you. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. And then um, the last one, the last question. So, I mean, I know usually for 
most of these things. I mean, if you should go for maybe, and maybe if you are going for an Arduino set, you know, usually there's a Arduino microcontroller. And then you have maybe a breadboard or something. You have some jumpers, you have some sensors, you have some actuators. You know, you have some LEDs and all that. I mean, usually those are just for prototyping. Now, my question is usually when you are building an actual project, when you are building an actual project, I'm just wondering how um, you'll be able to probably get everything onto the system and connect everything all together, whether it being wired. I mean, wirelessly, okay, even wirelessly, anyway. <coughs> because, I mean, in uh, let's say a, a house that you are trying to occupate, right? Definitely, you don't have all your stuff in one place. You have lights in every room. There are lights outside. You have sockets um, in every room. You have your fans and all that. And you are trying to connect them to um, one device, say the ESP32, for instance. I mean, there should be a way to get them all on board, whether it will be wired, whether it will be through Bluetooth or um, Wi Fi, or I mean, these other communication protocols that they are. And then, I mean, in this case, I don't know, would you? Let's say you are running cables, you do probably have to find a way to run your cables all the way from wherever the, um, the item is, the electrical component is, to where your microcontroller is. I mean, how are you even going to go about that in the first place? Okay, uh, so this is more technical. So I'm going to leave the, that to Samuel. But even before someone comes in, uh, I think uh, I understand. <laughs> I understand. Uh, I think I understand what you're asking. It can be a little daunting for going from uh, the prototyping and the testing to actually building the, the real thing, right? But I mean, that's where design thinking comes in, where you go through the thought process aside. Uh, justifying the need for whatever you need to work on and assessing its viability and all that, you go through the actual uh, build, right, and how you want it to be. So based on what you want to develop, what your, your device is going to do at the end of the day, that would inform what sort of casing you need to provide for it. And in that casing, you will have uh, a way to connect all the different parts. Now, when you get there, we can talk about uh, uh, calling in services. So there are, there are people who actually do uh, PCB printing in case you need that to actually print a PCB for you based on your design specifications. And there are companies that also do uh, fabrications from 3D printing to uh, that's 3D printing with plastic or metal based on, again, your specifications, right? So uh, the short answer, which I suspect won't really be answering you, is it depends on what you are building. That will inform how you are going to do all of that. But again, I'll leave it to Samuel to uh, give a bit more detail. I'm sure he'll be able to say it better than I just did. So Samuel, maybe you can help Bain it out. Yeah, hello, Hato. I think I think you said it all. Yeah, it depends on the project that you are working on. So I'm going to give an example, right? For instance, mm -hmm. I made mention of the DH11, right? So for both the temperature and humidity senses, we we have sorry, we have um a lot of temperature and humidity sensors just from the dht family right so we have dht 11 and dht 22 right mm -hmm. mostly yeah. being used for prototypes 
right? Okay. They are used for prototypes. But okay. you can use the DHT21, which has been designed for outdoor activities, right? So mostly the reason why we use the DHT11 and DHT22 for prototypes is that when you deploy them outside, they cannot, I mean, the weather conditions and all those things. I mean, they can give you accurate readings, right? But it wasn't built for outdoor activities, right? So the DHT21 has been built for those activities. So you using the DHT21 is going to work the same way the DHT11 or the DHT22 works, right? But it's going to be just a little bit robust, right? For the weather conditions, right? And it's like that with uh, most devices. So with the projects that you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about, let's say, if you, are, if you have plugs and you want to communicate with everything, perhaps per your design, you would want to probably use multiple ESPs. So from the presentation, I did mention that you can use a ESP32 as a router or yeah. as something that connects to the router, right? So you can have one main ESP32 acting as a router, right? Mm -hmm. And in your house, maybe the fan, the fan can be connected to one ESP32. One plug can be connected to one ESP32. The TV can be connected to one ESP32. And all this sends data to, I mean, one ESP32, right? Mm -hmm. So when you come to that one ESP32, you can use it to control everything in the house. I don't know if you get what I mean. Yeah, yeah, so it depends on your design, right? You can either yeah. do it that way, or you can you can control all the. I mean, the you can use like let's say if you are working on like a socket project, right? You want to make all your sockets, all the sockets in your house, be connected to your ESP thirty two. You can also design it in a way where you use one ESP32, but you use a relay model, a relay model that can connect to, I mean, I don't know if you know this, since you said you already have some knowledge in IoT, right? But then there are things like eight channel relay models. There are even 16 channel relay models. There are 32 yes. channel yes. relay models. Yes, exactly. So you can just connect the 32 channel relay models or the 16 channel relay models to one ESP32. And these outputs of the e uh, relay models goes to every plug that you have. You understand? So yeah. if you have the 16 channel what? relay model, you mm -hmm. can actually uh, actually control 16 plugs yeah. from your home, right? Yeah. So yes, yeah. just as what happens it depends on the if you yeah. want to go with the multiple ESPs communicating to one ESP, that's fine. If you want to go with using the relay models and just one ESP controls the relay models to give outputs and outputs okay. to the clocks, that's also fine. It depends on your design. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that again, again our course covers all these things <laughs> mm. so yeah okay that's fine um so and some of this one there the one last request from you can you is it also possible for you to also share maybe your email my email yeah okay Okay, so as someone does that, oh, but before that, uh, Benin, I hope you are good now, or do you have a yeah, lot? I'm, I'm good now. Okay, uh, and I think I'll just check in the website. It says that the next class starts in January 24. Is that it? Yes, yes, that's it. Okay, okay, all right. All right, thank you for those great questions, Benin. Uh, so we have Onassis also. So Onassis, go right ahead and ask your question. Hello, good afternoon. 
Okay, yeah. so um, when you were speaking, you made mention of um, the PSBs being made, um, like being made, like you can order for some to be made, 3D printings and stuff. I know of the plastic, but I don't really know of um, the metal being, being done in Ghana. Were you referring to Ghana or maybe somewhere else? Because I was in need of um, a service like that. But my only option was to do it out outside, like order, order it from outside. So if there is a company in Ghana that is doing it, you can share with me so that I get to speak to them. Okay, all right, analysis. So uh, for me personally, I, I don't know of any in Ghana that do, uh, but I don't know if someone knows any uh, in Ghana that do so, but I was mostly re referring to uh, placing orders outside. Uh, and there, there are companies uh, that help you with su such things. So they facilitate the shipping and everything so you can order through them to make things easier. Or you could place the order directly with those companies because most of them ship worldwide, right? But then again, if there are any such services uh, domiciled out here in Ghana, I'll let uh, Samo say. So Samo, do you know of any that could help Onassis? No, so I don't know of any. I don't know of any, but you can also look at alternatives. Because there are places in Ghana where you can do CNC plasma cutting or laser cutting, right? So in case you want your casing to be in a, to be a metal, right? You can look at those options too. But for three D printing with metals, I don't know of any in Ghana. But yeah, I know separate, like separate, not um, combined, like separate models. models. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. A company that does make um, metal modeling, or um, let's say, I know of um, the plastic. I know of the plastic because of the 3D uh, printers. I know some friends who, who can build using their 3D printers, but I was yeah. thinking of the metals, if there's an option in Ghana like that. Oh no, so for the modeling, the modeling is the same, is the same device, I mean the same software you use to design the the uh, the thing you want to model, your case or something like that. It's the same thing. It's just whether it will be metal or plastic, it depends on the 3D printers you use, right? The filaments you use. You yeah, it's it's what I'm I was trying to say with that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't know of any in Ghana. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, please, can you share the ones you guys use so that we we can get to interact with them too? The As in, companies you um you work with with the um, the PCB others. Oh, you want PCB? PCB is different from three D printing. I, I, get, I get it. Yes, okay. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, okay. let me let me chip in here so uh, we don't run long. So I, 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 I think I, I get I get your need, Onassis. So from here, uh, having joined, I mean we have your contact now. Uh, so we'll definitely be in touch to uh, share resources with you, including our newsletter. But well, you can opt out of that. But we will be sharing uh, uh, more information with you after this particular webinar. Uh, for example, we have another webinar, another IoT webinar coming on later anyway. Uh, so yes, we will be in touch and uh, you can ask uh, any other resources that re we, you require and then we can uh, furnish you with those uh, details accordingly. Sorry, one last question. I wanted to ask: um, Is there? Do you guys have a beginner course for someone trying to start in IoT, like from basics, complete basic? Uh, yes, 
So our implementing an IoT solution is uh, very beginner friendly because it starts from the basics, right from uh, the basics of basic electronics, all the way through the basics of IoT itself and the various stages, and it builds on that systematically, right? So our implementing an IoT so solution course is very beginner friendly. Okay. Um, Hato, I think you can also let him know about the link and the promos. Uh, yes. Uh, so in case you didn't catch that, I mean, you can check out our website, cloudschool.africa, link in the chat. And for those on the call today, you have the exclusive, uh, offer of 30 percent off the current price which has already been slashed uh, and you just need to use the promo code esp32 on checkout right so visit our website and you find the iot course on there and then you can enroll All right, so I see uh, Stephen Tufour has his hand up. Um, I am trying to elevate you so you can you can unmute and talk, but um, it's it's not it's not working for you. So maybe, oh wait, okay, I think you can now. So Stephen, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, good afternoon. I will thank you for your presentation. I really, um, I'm, I'm much impressed. But I wanted to find out the duration for the beginners in the IoT. The duration. We want to start from the scratch. Okay. All right. So, Samo, one second. Yeah, so it's going to be for two months, right? It's going to be for two months. And we are going to meet three times in a week. Every session is two hours. But we are also open to um, restructure everything to favor each participant that would be taking the course to. Is, is, is it also going to be um, online? Yeah, it's going to be online. Okay. okay. So, um, I mean, I mean to uh, um, engineer Airford. All right. But uh, I know most of our system, I know somebody asked a question in concerning about connecting a lot of gadgets or a lot of sockets or, or lightnings to um, the ESP32. So, and the products, sometimes you see the products come with by the money that you deal with. Um, hello, please. You are breaking a little bit from me. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I was I was asking. Um, yeah, I can hear you. The product sometimes, yeah, we have we have this system whereby um, earlier on somebody made a, uh, asked a question concerned about putting up a structure or a building whereby you want to have access or regulate all your devices. Let's say your circuit or your lightning on one device 
either on the Bluetooth or on the Wi-Fi system. Sometimes those products, when it comes with the manufacturers, so in your own aspects, you also have your own products that you do in with, like. Oh, okay, 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 I get you. So I've worked on projects that's that similar stuff, right? But I've not yet made it a, step, a startup, or I've not yet made it a product. I just do it for, I mean, to see the working principle, to see whether it can work. That, that, is, like, that is theoretical. Yes. Yes. Uh, no, Samo, hold on. Uh, so I think with what you're asking, we don't uh, we don't manufacture components. Uh, we don't do component manufacture. Uh, we work on projects with components that are already available that are developed by companies like Wazi App, like um, Arduino and uh, those who do manufacture these uh, boards and sensors as well. So we, we work on projects with the components, we don't develop components ourselves. And for the projects we work on, we don't work, we currently don't work, we don't work on any commercial uh, productions per se. It is a project for the purpose of research and for the purpose of training, right? So not not theoretical per se, just that we don't develop commercial products. Okay, I thought he was asking me personally if I've worked on that project, on projects like what I mentioned before. Is that what you meant, Stephen? Hello. All right. So I see Onassis is back. Uh, did we? Okay. We um, I, heard, I heard you say you work on um, research projects. So do you? I was, I was, um, I wanted to ask, do you <laughs> collaborate with other people to work on your project? It was, I had a project that, I had a project in mind and you mentioning working on research projects, decided to bring it up and hear from you. So what kind of research projects do you guys work on? And uh, is it mainly for training purposes or how is it like? Okay. All right. So we have uh, a partner company uh, also that we partner with, Foundry Camp, and they are a startup foundry. And so they provide uh, accelerator uh, services, right? Acceleration. So with the, uh, the, the members of their community, uh, we can step in to provide the capacity building uh, requirements, right? For our, our, for our partner, right? As, as need be. So in that way, we do work on projects that other people have. So if you, if you have an idea prototype you're working on, which you would like to build upon, then Foundry Camp, our partner company, uh, would be the best, the best for you, right? Uh, but then for the research projects I was talking about is mostly for our internal benefits and for the benefits of uh, our students, right? So uh, just like with any educational institution, we need to uh, be abreast with the times and all the technology. So we need to constantly try things out and work on projects ourselves so we would be armed with the right skills and the right knowledge to also pass on, right? So for, for that part, that is usually the, the, the purpose of our project, right? And to help our partner Foundry Camp, as I mentioned, with uh, capacity building services for the members of their community. So you can check out Foundry Camp also 
Um, they can help you if you have a project you are working on or an idea you want to turn into a startup. Okay, so, um, I would I would try that. Is that Petal Foundry, right? Uh, it's it's Foundry Camp. So I'll leave the URL. Foundry. Okay. Yes, Foundry dot com. And okay. with that, you can you can still talk to Samuel about it as well. So you can email Samuel about it, and he can guide you through the process. He doubles uh, as a, an IoT engineer on the Foundry Camp team as well. So, uh, I mean, he's part of the, the team, so he can definitely help you get settled in if uh, that is what you need. I really appreciate that. And I will be our best Yeah, we'll All right. Awesome. So, all too soon, or rather, all too long, <laughs> uh, depending on um, how engaged you were, we have come to the end of our webinar for today. Uh, please, can I ask the last question? Uh, yes. Who is this? Um, the I mean, I mean right. after, after um, let's say someone that actually partakes in the online the course right yes how else, do you guys have any avenues for internships yes yes we do uh so as i mentioned we have um our partner company foundry camp we also have another partner cloudport uh okay. so and uh due to our partnership with foundry camp and cloudport we have access to other startups and organizations that do carry out IoT projects, right? So we we can work with you to place you in those organizations. Uh, I mean, our our goal with the IoT program is for you to gain practical working knowledge, right? Experiential knowledge. It is all part of it. Afterwards, we uh, depending on what your learning objectives are right and your your goals are for enrolling we can find a slot for you to uh intend and gain more experience okay 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 fine that's fine, that's fine. and then um then the other thing also i mean during this whole um during the course um would would you guys provide us with a list of components that you probably need to procure just to make sure that what your learning process is successful? I think it's going to be an online, is it going to be an online course? Yes, yes, we will. So we will uh, have a, a checklist of things you need to uh, effectively write um participate in the in the course and the training and yes it is uh mostly online but we are working on uh something uh i, I wouldn't want to put someone on the spot but for those who do enroll uh i mean we go through we have um we have a plan and we can set up uh, uh, an in-person uh, sort of boot camp, right? That is a separate event we are considering, a boot camp to run through all that we've done and uh, work on pro prototypes in person so you can experience uh, uh, some more live, right? And in living color. Okay. But that discussion uh we can have once the the course is started so there are there are more things that are more or less uh sort of exclusive to the to our learners but yes our our entire our whole aim and our whole uh, objective 
is to have you go from uh, not, not being sure how to go about your project to developing a prototype which you are ready to transform into uh, a finished product, right? And however, whatever needs to be done to, 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 to get there, we have in place, right? So it's, it's, it's not about knowing what the ESP32 is, it's about being able to uh, use it in a project and have a prototype that uh, you have developed yourself, right? Yeah. Okay. And then, um, the last thing, and I, I'll just check in to see if, I mean, the, the, the platform to fill the form and make the payment is not up yet. Is that the case? Because I'll just try and then I think when you click on a rule now, the page that comes up, they get oh, okay. Okay, it wasn't working before. I tried again, it's working now. So it's fine. Okay, it's fine. all right. I'm done with my question. All right, thank you, Benin. Okay, so uh, I mean, we've we've actually gone past our time. It was supposed to be two hours. Uh, that was four. But I see Stephen still has uh, a question. So uh, let me let me uh, say my last words. We'll hear from Stephen, and then once we are done with Stephen, then we can close. Right. So. In conclusion, uh, thank you all for joining us, for those who joined the stream on, on YouTube, and for those who uh, registered and were actually a part of the call on Google Meet, right? And we look forward to uh, seeing you in class for the complete course. And as I mentioned, we have another IoT webinar coming up. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. On all of these platforms, uh, our username is The Cloud School, T, The Cloud School, right? Just look up The Cloud School on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, right? And on YouTube also, Cloud School, with school being SCH, right? And then you can subscribe and you keep up to date with all of our upcoming events. We have, uh, a webinar uh, which is another free class on interactive dashboard creation in two weeks so uh, if you are interested in that as well also sign up uh, uh, and then you can join us for that one all right so thank you all for joining uh, but before we go just very quickly let's uh, attend to Steven's request and then will be done. Yes, so Stephen, please go ahead and ask okay. the question. Thank you. I'll, I'll reserve most of, most of my questions so that maybe next time. But uh, the promo code for the, that's what I wanted you to, to get it right now for the promo code. Oh, you made okay. mention something. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so it's ESP32, right? ESP32. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great. So that gets you uh, thirty percent off the current uh, cost fee. And uh, Stephen, you can go ahead and uh, send an email if you have more questions, and then we'll, we'll take care of it. And okay. All right. So thank you, everyone, and. Thank you. Uh, I hope to see you in our future uh, online events and hopefully in class someday, All right? All right, so bye everyone, have a nice evening. Oh, last thing, the recording will be available on our website, so you can watch it on demand afterwards, right? If you want to go back to it. So that will also be available.
All right. Ciao.